Hi, and welcome back to this Free For All Friday, Focal Point AFR Talk. Number to call, 888-589-8840. We'll take your phone calls this segment and through the rest of the half hour, 888-589-8840. Uh, and uh, I think what I want to begin by just kind of closing the loop on uh, Ukraine, we're going to talk about a number of different topics in this segment and then take your phone calls. But uh, Russia has started war games just 280 miles from the Ukraine border, from Ukraine. So they're not going to let this thing go. I mean, they're dead serious. Putin is serious about it. And they're saying, oh, these are just war games. We just or, or just regularly routine war games that we normally do. So they're denying that the, these war games are connected to what's going on in Ukraine. But even the Russian media says, no, there's a link between the two. And listen to this. 3,500 troops, 1,000 units of military hardware. It's a month-long air defense exercise. They are going to, uh, the, the, the exercise, the drills will culminate in live firing of air defense systems, including S-300 long-range surface-to-air missiles, BUK M1 medium-range missiles, and Strela 10 short-range missiles, it is the largest ever exercise held by air defense units of the Western Military District. So Putin is uh, rattling a saber, and of course the people there know that he won't just rattle a saber, he'll pull it out and use it. Now one of the reasons why nothing is going to happen here, I don't think there's any way we're sending troops in there, and under this commander-in-chief, I don't know who in their right mind would trust him to be in charge of any sort of military uh, exercise. Everything he touches to uh, touches turns to powder when it comes to military power and, and international confrontations. But another reason that nothing is going to happen is because 30 to 40 percent of all of Europe's oil and gas comes through pipelines that run across Ukraine. And Russia is threatening to shut them off. So, so you're not going to get anything from NATO. NATO's not going to do anything. Germany's not going to do anything. France is not going to do anything. Now, their, their silence has been absolutely stunning. Why? Because they know that Putin will just turn off the tap and they will have no gas and no energy. 30 to 40 percent of their supplies come from Russia, piped through gas lines that run across uh, Ukraine. And Russia's already out there saying, look, right now Ukraine owes us $1.89 billion for natural gas that we've already shipped. They've got a bill for almost $2 billion, and we want our money. Now, you remember our uh, Congress is about ready to designate a billion dollars. I think that's a mistake, but they're about ready to designate a billion dollars in aid to Ukraine. Where is that going to go? Where is that billion dollars going to wind up going? It's going to go into Putin's pocket. First thing Ukraine's going to do is use it to pay down their debt on natural gas so they don't get uh, shut off. Now, I came across a letter from a member of the military, retired U.S. Army colonel. He's working in Ukraine with some of their military law enforcement uh, services uh, there. So this is not a strat for report, but it comes from somebody who is on the ground in Ukraine. And it gives you kind of a larger picture of the dynamics in Ukraine. Now, his point here is when you have the fall of the Soviet Union, like you did in 1990, and Don and Sandra Tipton were there, 1991, the day that uh, uh, that um, Gorbachev was kidnapped, 1991, Puerto Riga. Uh, anyway, um, said so you have to have something replace that. If, if the communist regime, the communist politicians fall out of power, something has got to take their place in these countries like Ukraine. And here's what he says, the only groups that were ready or are ready to replace the communists, the only groups with a formal, semi-formal hierarchy, any kind of organization, any kind of change of command, any resource procurement procedures, all the things that you need to run a government, the only groups immediately available are the crooks and the criminal organizations. So in other words, they just move in. There's this vacuum created in 1991 when the Soviet Union kind of falls apart. A vacuum of political leadership is created. It requires structure, leadership, chain of command. The only people that can come in and supply that are the bad guys. 
uh, the, the mafia, the criminal organizations and the crooks. So they come in and take over. And then he says what happens is the people eventually get tired of that and they have elections so they can actually boot these people out. They can vote them out. Who comes back in? The old communists, the communists that ran the country to uh, begin with. And that's why you'll hear some of our leaders, and they're right, Rand Paul has talked about this, putting a billion dollars in the hands of corrupt politicians in Ukraine. It doesn't make any sense uh, because you're giving this money to people that are corrupt, largely in a system that is corrupt to the core. You know, and he says, look, there's no civil service system in Ukraine. Everything operates under bribes, blackmail, extortion. If you're working in the government and you don't offer a bribe to your new boss, politically appointed or elected, uh, you're out of uh, work. You're out of a job. Cops there, he says, they don't enforce traffic laws. Instead, they fight to get a traffic control checkpoint on a good street so they can stop law-abiding citizens and fleece them uh, for money. Businesses are extorted by officers attempting to enforce unwritten city codes. And he says, when I got here, I was just flat amazed at how deep the corruption was. Now, what he does say is, look, I am encouraged by what the Ukrainians have done in the last few months. They are fighting back against the corruption. They are fighting for their freedom. They're fighting for liberty. They are fighting for justice. So he's rooting for them, but he is not uh, optimistic because he knows that Putin is no way he's going to allow the, these new Ukraines to succeed in their effort. That's why he's invaded Crimea and he's now threatening Western Ukraine. Here is the one thing that he says may be the... Um, X factor in all of this, something we don't normally think about. He says Poland. Now, Poland is on the western border of Ukraine. If Russia moves into Ukraine, which is in the western part of Ukraine, Crimea is gone. That's going to wind up back in the Russian Federation. You can forget about Crimea. It's history. It's toast. It's now part of Russia. And it's going to be uh, it's just a matter of time. But Ukraine still got a fighting chance. And he says, you know, the people that might stand up to Russia are the Poles, Poland. He said, no matter what you've heard or think about the Polish military, their history as a military is brave. It's filled with stories of courage and uh, bravery. No one would ever accuse them of cowardice. If the Russians try to take Western Ukraine, the Poles, he says, might surprise everyone. So that's what's going on over in Ukraine. Well, let's grab some phone calls, free for all Friday, 888-589-8840. Let's go to Bill in Billington, West Virginia. Bill, what's on your mind? Hi, Brian. Hey. I just want to make a comment on one of your last callers in the first hour about uh, uh, Obama not really running the country and people being behind him or running the country, and he's just a... Oh, yeah, he's just kind of a figurehead and um, kind of somebody pulling the strings, uh-huh. My father, we came to this country in the early 50s, well, 51, 50. He was a steel worker, but he lost his interest in being a steel worker, had a passion for gardening. So he became a gardener for... Mr. M. W. Clement, who was the Pennsylvania Railroad at the time mm -hmm. in Rosemont, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right at that time is when Eisenhower was running for office. Eisenhower came to his estate several times. After the election in November of '52, one night, uh, Mr. Clement said to me, "Billy, you going to be watching TV tonight?" I said, "Well, there's nothing on, Mr. Clement." He said. At that time, there's only one or two channels. He said, you'll see me. I want you to watch it. They're going to be introducing Eisenhower, and there'll be ten men sitting behind him. And this, uh, this man told me it's right to my face, and it did happen. He said, there'll be ten men sitting behind him. I'll be one of them. We're running the country. Huh. So, so he said, we, the ten of us, kind of the industrial magnets, we are the ones that are running the country. We put him where he is. We put him where he is, he, and right. so he is kind of taking his cues from us. And that's and that came, the old man told me that right to my face, and I did watch TV that night, and sure enough, and, there he was sitting right there. And, and there it was, huh? And remember, in that, in that year, 1952, that was a landslide for the Republicans yeah. against the Democrats. Yeah. Maybe this, in 2016... Maybe we'll have the same thing. Well, and what you're what you're suggesting, Bill, is that these dynamics really go on both sides of the aisle. You know, you look at John Boehner. John Boehner is a Republican. He's out there again talking about amnesty. He's only got 19 Republicans out of 200 and whatever that support him on amnesty, but he's still talking about doing it. Why? Because there are guys like this Clement fella 
that are behind him, giving money to his campaign, promising money to the Republican Party if they will open the floodgates and allow a flood of illegal immigrants into the country. So you still got the deal, I'm afraid, Bill, where kind of money talks and Republicans, just like Democrats, can be sort of in hock to these guys that have the money and the power and then try to shape public policy to do the bidding of the power brokers and, you know, so little guys like uh, like you and me, Bill, that wind up getting the shaft. So. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you on that. All but right, Bill. Okay, thanks a lot for the call. I appreciate that very, very much. Let's go to Noah in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Noah, welcome. What's on your mind? Hey, thank you. Yeah, we, we seem to have chosen a comfortable slavery over a dangerous freedom, but I, I called about a story with my my first trip to Haiti uh, with friendships in 06. Oh. Um, we took the hope and the mercy out of Lake Charles, and Don was on the ship with us. I'd taken one of those little hammocks with me, little pocket hammocks. Uh huh. <laughs> and there were already two strung up on deck. Uh, long day, end of the day, I was on watch and went to take a nap in one of the hammocks uh, to get ready for my next watch, and it was Don hammock. I didn't know it till later. Huh. <laughs> He had come and saw me sleeping, didn't wake me up. Uh, and just a long story boring, I really got to see his heart through the whole thing, for the wow. whole trip. I was there for two and a half months. Good people, solid people, trustworthy organization, and top notch. Wow. Uh, and just uh, really uh, grateful for that experience. And uh, we'll keep praying for you all in your ministry. All right, no, listen, thank you very much. And that's high praise indeed for the quality of the people at Friendships, Friendships org. It's friendships with an S on the end, friendships, plural, dot org. Get more information about what Don and Sandra Tipton have done. And Jeff uh, Reed and his wife, Ann, were uh, working with Friendships for some time, actually, before they came here to AFR. Uh, we'll be right back with more of your phone calls, more content. I want to remind you about a new movie that's going to premiere on March 21st. That's coming up just two weeks from today, March 21st. The movie is God's Not Dead going to be released in theaters. It's a family-friendly film that is packed with truth. It's got a timely message for our culture. It follows a college freshman as he defends his faith and proves the existence of God to an unbelieving philosophy professor. You want to see it March 21st, God's Not Dead. Back in two. <laughs> 